All right. What's up, Master Music Marketing Club? Um, what, what are we going to call you? Let's call you the gang, the Master Music Marketing Gang. Um, I'm here because I promised you that I would be here um, to talk about hypnosis and what it means for music publishers and, and kind of just an overview of who they are, what their business model is, and what lessons we might be able to learn from them. Um, so if you're not aware, Hypnosis is a publicly traded company based in Germany, um, and they are basically taking the idea of a music publisher and taking that public um, and making themselves a publicly traded company who is really going all in on acquiring songwriters' assets. Um, so we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about what music publishing is, what a music publisher does. And then we're going to talk about hypnosis specifically and how they're taking that idea and really bringing it forward or backwards, depending on what your view of uh, these corporations, these types of corporations may be. Um, so let's talk about music publishing. Music publishing, we've talked about it several times before, right? But when you create a song, there are two copyrights that are created. There is your master, which is basically the sound recording. And then there's your composition. And your composition is the side that we typically refer to as your publishing. Um, these are the rights that the songwriter and the company that publishes your music, um, these are the rights that they own. Now, of course, if you're not signed to a publishing deal, then you are your own publisher and you get all of that money. Um, so there's 100% on the master side, there's 100% on the, um, actually 200% on the publishing side because there's the writer's share, which is worth 100%, and the publisher's share, which is worth 200, which is worth 100%. So if you own all of your publishing, you would actually say that you own 200% of your publishing. Um, which is confusing. It's just better. It's easier to just say I own a hundred percent. This is why I know. But if you're publishing, uh, if you're looking to put your music in syncs and stuff like that, they're going to ask you what you own. You have to tell them that you own two hundred percent. So that's um. You know what? I don't know why I'm rushing through this. I want to make sure you guys understand this, and you guys paid to be here. So let me uh, back up a second. So. Oh. How music splits work. Uh, of course, this glare is insane. Let me put my hand right here. There we go. So we've got the master recording. I'm pretty sure this is going to end up being backwards, but I don't remember. So you've got the master recording. If you're in a rec record deal, you typically hear that referred to as points. Points on a record is a percentage of the master revenue that you can earn. We're not talking about that today. That's a whole separate thing. And hypnosis has nothing to do with master recordings. Instead, they do have something to do with music publishing. So your music publishing is basically everything that you work out on a split sheet. You write down who your writers are, you write down who their publishing companies are, and you guys decide which percentages of each that they own. So writer share is worth 100%, publisher share is worth 100%. Hypnosis is taking the publishing or buying the publishing assets from musicians. So that's important to know. Now, why? let's talk about what a traditional music publishing company does. So a music publisher is someone who, or a company who basically takes songs. They, may, they usually sign songwriters and music producers, composers to deals and they help facilitate the songs being made. They'll probably, if you were a songwriter and you signed a publishing deal, it is not uncommon for your music publisher to call you up and say, hey, Dr. Dre needs some tracks. Can you come to this studio and help write? Or, hey, Taylor Swift is looking for new songs. Do you have anything that I can send to Taylor Swift? And their goal is to get those songs cut or recorded, right? Placed with an artist. So let's say, I wrote a song called Easy Breezy and, you know, someone says, hey, Chris Brown's looking for tracks. I'm like, oh, Chris Brown's name is Breezy. This song sounds like his style. Let me send this track to Chris Brown. If Chris Brown records that song. It ends up on his album. That means you got placed. And when that album starts to sell or if that song becomes a single, you know, you get the writer's share of music rights. We've talked about all those rights in 
uh, unit one, I believe we talk about the, the music royalties um, or is it, no, it's, it's unit two, week two, we talk about all the royalties. So um, you know all the different royalties you get, you get mechanical royalties, you get performance royalties, you get streaming royalties, you get a lot of royalties from being a songwriter on a song that's actually making some noise, generating spins and generating revenue, right? And it's not just you that gets that money. Typically, you get 100% of your writer's share and your music publishing company gets anywhere from 100% all the way down to 15% of the publisher's share of that revenue. So you can think of your songs almost as real estate, right? It's like you're, you're building homes, you're building houses, you're, you're bu putting, you have land and you're putting houses up on this land, right? And when you sign a publishing deal, they're trying to get someone to buy that house or even better, they're trying to get someone to rent that house and start paying cash flow, right? So Chris Brown comes and buys a song, they bought a house, now you're getting rent in the form of rev or royalties every three months or even every month depending on which royalty it is so you've got cash flow coming from that one song and a music publisher's job is to help you find more tenants or more artists to sing your songs and make you more money in exchange for their work they um, get a percentage of that revenue as well so a lot of people, you know, you may hear like, oh, don't give away your publishing, don't give away your publishing. Well, a publishing company who's doing its job correctly is actually helping you get those placements and the money wouldn't exist if they didn't exist also. Um, so whether or not you should sign a publishing deal is actually not as cut and dry. The, the biggest thing is making sure you don't sign a publishing deal too early and you don't sign a publishing deal that's not in your favor with a publisher who's not actually going to do the work to generate that revenue. So in a traditional music publishing deal, uh, what you typically see in the music business is a publisher, a music publisher, finds a new hot songwriter or a new hot producer, right? Typically what will happen is you get placed on a song and either that song just goes gets really big or you get you get placed with a bigger artist right and so something happens you go from being relatively unknown to people saying hey this guy just made a song that made like a couple of million dollars maybe they can make songs like that for other artists and we can share in some of that revenue if we help get them that exposure so they sign you as a young, a young upstart songwriter, music producer. And again, they put you in those rooms. They help you get, generate that revenue. Now, um, another business model for a music publisher is to say, well, if, you know, if music publishing is like real estate, why don't we buy the best real estate, right? Why don't we put our hotels on Boardwalk and Park Place, right? And so you start think you think about people like uh, Michael Jackson, when he bought uh, ATV Music Publishing and merged it with Sony. Uh, Sony ATV, they owned uh, the Beatles catalog, they own parts of Taylor Swift's catalog, they own parts of Michael Jackson's catalog, they own catalogs of huge artists and these are songs that are already established they're already hits they're already in movies all the time they're already on tv shows all the time so they're constantly generating revenue and now take that idea and let's enter hypnosis and so i'm going to share my screen and show you guys exactly what hypnosis is so first let's look at the uh their wikipedia page Hypnosis is a British music IP investment and song management company founded by Merck Mercuriatus and co-founded by Niall, by Niall Rogers. Niall Rogers uh, from Chic, good times. Um, but anyway, it's focused on songs and associated music intellectual property rights. It's founded on the premise that hit songs are long-term predictable assets that are not affected by economic cycles and they will increase in value as the worldwide music streaming market grows. So, and it says, in addition to acquiring songs and songwriter catalogs, the company manages the playlist, cover, interpolation, and synchronization revenues of this intellectual property. So they are a music publisher on steroids, and they've said that their business model, their target is to go after people 
who already have hit songs because the more people are streaming this, these hit songs, the more money is generated, right? So let's talk about just how quickly they have been snatching up artists' catalogs. So this is digitalmusicnews.com and I just searched for hypnosis. Here we go. In $323 million deal, this was five days ago, Hypnosis acquires 42 catalogs, including interest in Taylor Swift, Jay-Z, and 50 Cent tracks. Now, just to be clear, they're not buying them from Jay-Z, Taylor Swift, or 50 Cent, but producers who have interest in those tracks. Hypnosis snags L.A. Reid's 160-song catalog, including Whitney Houston, Boys to Men, Bobby Brown hits. That was October. In September, they raised $242 million in three days so they can invest in more catalogs. They've got Chrissy Hines, uh, or I think that's Hind, um, her catalog from The Pretenders. They bought Big Deal Music Group. So, I mean, and the, the, this goes on and on. The RZA, Barry Manilow, Mark Ronson. Um, they're buying catalogs from so many of the top artists and they're able to do that because again they're a publicly traded company they're raising stock prices um they can basically get as much money as they need to do whatever they want with it and what they want to do is buy very um lucrative music catalogs so they got timbaland's music they've got the chain smokers music they've got so many people um in here Instead of looking at it from the new standpoint, here, we've got it right here on their website. The Dream, Tricky Stewart, Sean Garrett, um, I don't even know who Stara is, Ari Levine, Dave Stewart, Chrissy Hand, Barry Manilow, Pooh Bear. So again, a great deal of these people are music producers and some are also songwriters. And, you know, it's important to know that if you write a song, you have a pretty substantial amount of money that you stand to make, right? As opposed to being the artist in a record deal, let's say I'm Rihanna, right? If I don't write my songs, I'm not making a lot of money off of my music. Um, I just make whatever percentage I negotiate with the label from the master recording. And that's after the label recovers its costs. But if I'm a songwriter, I get paid from day one no matter what, I may get an upfront fee, but I'm also getting mechanical royalties whenever that song sells, which right now is 9.1 cents per record sold. Um, I'm getting royalties when it's on streaming. If that song gets played on a commercial, there are so many different ways that I get paid when a song is played. So if you're Timbaland, if you're you know, Mark Ronson, if you're any of these people, you've been getting paid for a long time off of these songs. But here's what happens over time the value of those songs or the the value of the 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 royalties starts to decline right because you know think about it you have a song that's a major hit at one point it's bringing in money left and right just all over the place and then after a while that song dies down a little bit and as that song dies down your revenue slows down it's going to take you a lot more money or a lot more time to make the same money that you did a few years ago right so a, a company like Hypnosis comes in and says, hey, I'll buy your entire music publishing catalog for $160 million right now. Well, yeah, you're giving up the rights to make any money from this in the future. But if you have $160 million, do you need to make money from your music moving forward? Or could you invest it in something that actually grows a little bit faster? So that is the... Um, that's the draw to an artist, you know, doing stuff like this. I mean, let's, again, let's look at these deals. When Timbal when they bought Timbaland's catalog, how much did they buy it for? Do they say? Doesn't say. Let's see. Let's see if we can figure out how much they've been buying these catalogs for. I think L.A. Reid was the one that they put up first. So for LA Reed, buyouts, financial terms weren't specified, pays well above market value. So we don't know how much they're paying for each of these catalogs, but they're paying plenty. Um, 
But yeah, you've got to know it's up there in the millions. When you think about how much they're raising in order to do this, it's a lot. Um, And again, I mean, they're raising billions of dollars to invest in these songwriters catalogs. So that's cool. That's cool, Brandon. But what does that mean for me as a songwriter? What does it mean for me as an artist? Why is this important to me? Because I'm not Timbaland. I'm not Miss Yelly. I'm not, you know, some huge songwriter. I'm not Bon Jovi or Barry Manilow. What does this mean for me? Well, the first takeaway I would say is if there's a company that is that interested in getting songwriters rights, it's probably something that's important to have, right? And it goes to show you that you don't want to give it away for nothing because there's somebody who 15 years down the road is going to say, hmm, that catalog's worth a lot. I'd like to pay this person $10 million for it, right? You can't get $10 million 15 years from now if you sell your publishing rights for $30,000 tomorrow because the $30,000 deal is way more common than the $10 million deal. Um, when there's a rapper from my hometown his name, well, his name is Mez now, but it was King Mez. And King Mez, when he just started to bubble, um, this was back in 2013-ish, when he was just starting to make some noise, he signed a publishing deal. And that publishing deal helped him out a lot. They paid him $30,000. That's not a small amount of money, especially if you don't have money. That was enough money to buy a studio space, to buy all the equipment that he needed and make songs full time without having to worry about going to a job or anything like that. The next year, they put him in the studio with Dr. Dre. He wrote 13 out of 15 songs on the Dr. Dre album and ended up recouping his deal um, and, you know, doing very well. But again, these music publishers traditionally are going to go after you when you haven't made a lot of noise yet. Or maybe you've got one or two songs that somehow found their way onto MTV or into heavy rotation on the radio. That's when they're going to go after you. And you need to know how companies are operating so that you know what you want to negotiate, right? You want to know what this may be worth, not just what it's worth now so that you can make an informed decision about how much your music is worth. So Terry, I know that you are starting a publishing company and you have specific interest in hypnosis and and what everything they've got going on. And maybe the question could be, well, if hypnosis is out there, how do I compete as a small publisher? And the answer is you give out fair deals, right? You don't, um, you don't go in trying to get, 100% of everyone's publishing all the time. Um, You don't go in offering, you know, pennies for something that's worth dollars. But instead, you offer fair deals and you do your best to do right by your clients. You do best to do, uh, do your best to make sure you are networking, you're getting in the right rooms with the right people, and that people understand who you are and that you have songwriters that are amazingly talented, right? If you're able to place your songs or place your clients' songs with the right people, you can make yourself a lot of money and you can make your songwriters a lot of money. And that's all a songwriter wants to do. They want to be able to make a living. So how you compete with these big companies that seem predatory at times is you make good deals, you do good business. Um, And if you want to be a company like Hypnosis in the future, the answer to that is just you got to have a lot of money it is going to cost you so much money to acquire these songwriters catalogs. Um, And um, yeah, if you have access to that type of capital, if you have access to those types of investors and you have the relationships in the music industry to make these things happen, um, because one of the co-founders of Hypnosis was a music manager for a while. He had managed people like Beyonce, um, Elton John, Morrissey, Nile Rodgers. He managed a lot of these people So he had connections in the music industry. That's not something that we should gloss over or look over. So you've got to be well connected. You've got to do good business and people have to trust you. Those are the three takeaways that I have for you. Um, Sorry this took so long. It was hard to find a quiet moment to actually record this and be able to go as deep as I wanted to. But I hope this was helpful. If you have questions about music publishing, if you have questions about 
what hypnosis does, what a comp what value a company like hypnosis may have in 2020. Leave them in the comments of this video. I'm happy to go even more in depth and answer any questions you have. And maybe we'll talk about it on our next coaching call, or maybe I'll even do like another coaching call uh, where we can talk about it separately. Just let me know what you guys think, and um, I'll talk to you soon. Peace.